Hello, hello, and welcome to the 1 p.m. session for Data Over Instinct 2020. I am so excited for our next presentation. So we have Anvil's own Brett Lohmeyer. He is the Director of Analytics and Decision Science here at Anvil, and his presentations are always really fun. No pressure, Brett but they always make me entertained and uh, ensure that I learn something at the same time. So I'm looking forward to this. I'll tell you, I'll be completely honest, whenever he first pitched this session topic to me, um, I thought it was way too technical for the audience. Uh, for me, I thought it'd be too technical, but especially for the audience, we're trying to target non-technical marketers, people who don't know about analytics and they want to learn. But after he walked me through the brief and I saw the slides, I think everybody is really going to enjoy it. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to let Brett take over. Okay. And we'll get going. Are you able to see my screen? We sure can. It looks perfect. Okay, great. Um, this is super ambitious, so let's just get started. So welcome to my presentation on making predictions in R in minutes. I have a lot I want to cover, so let's get started. Um, my number one goal is to remove the myth that machine learning and other forms of predictive statistics are magic. Uh, to make this happen, we're going to dive in and use machine learning immediately. Uh, please be prepared. This presentation requires you to be interactive. It might be good to open a second tab in your browser, one to see what I'm doing, and one to do the work yourself. If you get lost or stuck, I will provide a link with to the code we created at the end of the presentation for you to download. Sometimes things happen, you never know. So, and you'll always have a recording of this presentation after the conference, you can go at, at your own pace. So let's get started. So first go to this URL, rstudio.cloud, where you can just Google rstudio cloud. Um, this is the online version of rstudio, a software that makes R easy to use. And you can create a basic account for just zero dollars. Once you get to the RStudio homepage, it should look something like this. And what we're gonna do is there should be a couple of big white buttons if they haven't changed the layout in the last few hours. One that says get started for free. So we'll go ahead and click that. So you remember it's RStudio Cloud and then click that get started for free button. On the next page after that, you're gonna, you'll click that button and it'll tell you about the cloud free options. And it gives you a couple of details, not really important to us. What we really care about here is that sign up button in gray near the bottom right. Uh, so go ahead and click that sign up button. Uh, and then you're gonna go ahead and create an account. So I would recommend using the step sign up with Google as it gets a new account started very quickly. So once again, if you're a little bit behind our studio cloud, and then we use the free version, get started, you should be taken to this page. Um, so if you use the get started with Google, all you need is a Gmail account or an email account that's connected to the Google suite. If you use this process, it will ask you to approve the integration with your Google account, give you a couple pop-ups. You know, Google always does that. Uh, there'll be a few steps there and it's gonna close that pop-up and take you to the following page. If you don't want to use the Gmail sign up, that's, that's also fine too. The email is simple. Just make sure you remember your password, obviously. But it'll send you an email to your, your email account. So once you're set up with that authentication, it will take you back to our studio to create your account. Um, on, and it's this page I'm showing right here. So we're really cooking now. Uh, it'll ask you to create a name for your account, but it defaults, it should default to your name. I don't really have a problem with that. I just uh, had Brett Lohmeyer. Uh, anvil, right? So I just added the anvil. So hopefully everyone is at that point, but I'll give you a few seconds to catch up. Good news, this is pretty straightforward, and this is kind of the big, uh, everybody's got scrambling to get in the same place kind of part, but once we get through this, we'll all kind of be in the same places at the same time. And there might be some chats here. Oh, and that's just Jenny being able to, making sure everyone's following along. So thank you so much, Jenny. Um, so hopefully uh, everyone's at this point. Um, once again, is that you go to our studio cloud, getting started for free, sign up. You just go ahead and create your account. And, and if you got this far, um, you, you, you can use your R studio account anytime you want, absolutely free. Um, so congratulations to that. You got an R studio. You can start getting involved in this stuff. So if you haven't clicked that big blue create account, go ahead and do that right now. You go ahead and create an account. So 
you now have this account to do analytics, or if you're feeling really saucy, we can call this data science. Um, I think it's really great for everyone in marketing to be able to do this. Uh, Jenny's presentation, she talked about how she had hired a data scientist, but really didn't have the experience in that field. So it's really hard for Jenny to kind of translate what she wanted and that person to kind of understand. So in this case, once you kind of get a feel for this, you can at least uh, understand some of the basic stuff they're doing in machine learning and get a better uh, way to communicate with these people. So the R Studio Cloud has a few different options of things you can do, but it's really all silly if you don't actually have a project. So to remedy that, we're gonna go ahead and click on that big blue uh, new project button to go ahead and create one. So they're gonna be a loading screen. This is, there's a couple different loading points. This is one of the, the first three um, where R Studio is gonna create an environment for you. If it takes more than 15 seconds, you might have a, a slow internet connection. So I apologize for that. Uh, there are about three points in the process. Again, we're waiting for the software run. And I think that's a good lesson to, uh, about working with analysts and, and data scientists as they love, they would love to work faster, but they are working with tools. Even the best tools have some limitations. And sometimes a single model can take several minutes to run as it's going over like millions of permutations of the data. So, you know, try to be patient. This is a good learning that these people are doing the best they can. They're just sort of like limited by their software. So as long as your computer was basically made after the wedding of say Prince William and Kate Middleton, you should be able to see the screen after a few seconds. So kind of let's like dig into what we're looking at. Um, so if you're still waiting for your project to load, you can go ahead and just look at my screen for the next two slides. And then hopefully when you jump back, you'll be uh, all set. So the area on the left is where you're going to write and run code. And this is called the source window. Right now, it's showing the console. The window to the right of the source window will show you some globally accessible uh, stuff for your workspace, like data you've created. But we've created none so far, so this is just blank. There's really nothing here yet. The last window in the bottom right shows you files you have in our studio. And it can also be used to reference back to tables, the help, and all of those other cool things that we are not going to go over today. Um, we could start writing code in the console and in the source window right now, but I'm going to use something called a notebook. So an R notebook is an R file with uh, sections of code that, be, that can be executed independently uh, and output becomes visible immediately beneath the input code. It's a much more nonlinear approach to R. I'm a big fan of it. So to do that, to create a new notebook, click on file in the menu on the, on the top of the project, and then click new file, or hover over new file, and then you're going to click our notebook. So I'll give everybody a chance in case anything got messed up. You're going to go to file, hover over new file, and I'll give you that secondary drop down, and you're going to click on our notebook. Once you do that, you're going to be asked to add a bunch of packages. Go ahead and click yes right now, and then we'll talk about them. Because um, this is a collection of R functions, people much, much smarter than myself created. And these are kind of all things needed to make a notebook work. After you say yes, the computer's not going to actually show anything. I'll kind of close that window out, not show anything for about 15 seconds. That's completely normal. When things are going well in R and a lot of other things like Python, you don't get any feedback. So it's kind of like a weird kind of feedback, like, hey, everything's great. I'm not going to show you anything. Uh, once that loads, you're gonna see our notebook with the file name of Untitled One and the on-page title of our notebook. Uh, I'll give everyone a bit of time for this to load. This, this is gonna be the slowest one to load. Uh, here, as we're waiting, I'll go ahead and uh, talk about myself. So I am the Director of Analytics and Decision Science at, at Anvil Analytics, as, as Jenny mentioned. I've been here for about three years and I, I really love what I do. Uh, I did not include any pictures of dogs, but I did include pictures of my children. So maybe that's a little bit better. I don't know. Uh, uh, so my job, I get to learn about data and all day and work with that. I get to tell people about that data. It's really fun to work. Uh, in addition to that, I'm also an instructor of web analytics at the bootcamp for the University of Missouri St. Louis. So if any of my students are in this course and you're attending, go ahead and say hi and I'll, I'll make sure you got an A. Um, Last, uh, I did want to say that I am a big fan of R. And I do use R for some complex projects, data analysis on my job, but I am far from an expert. 
and, and that's okay. Um, you don't have to be an expert at R to use it. And in fact, if you are an expert at R, this presentation is not gonna be very uh, interesting to you. So sorry about that. It's for the rest of us. I can look in some more chats. Oh, yep, I got a few students here as well. That's great. Thank you. So wait, all right, ideally, your notebook should be loaded by now. Now, all we have to do is set up your first uh, art notebook and you can start writing code and do analysis pretty much right now. So we're gonna really jump into it. We're 10 minutes in and we're ready to start doing this and I'm pretty excited. So if you look at rows 10 through 12 in the source window, that's the window on the left, you will see executable R code. This code will have a gray background and start with three quote marks and the letter R in some curly brackets. This tells uh, the notebook that this is R code. <laughs> You, will, you could also say use SQL here to run SQL code if you change the R to SQL. So just a little note there. So to execute the R code starting on line 10, you actually wanna click the little green arrow the furthest to the right of the source window. And I've circled what you should click. So go ahead and do that. Once you click that arrow, you will see a scatter plot of speed and distance for stopping a car. This is a plot of the data set called cars. The, this plot visualizes a trend that as you, your speed increases while driving a car, which is the horizontal axis, it takes greater distance to stop the car. That's the, the uh, vertical axis. It's groundbreaking stuff, right? Okay, maybe not. I think we can actually do something much more awesome. That's what I wanna do. Uh, if, and what we need is a little more interesting data than just speed and the uh, distance here. So. Uh, the great thing about R though, is it gives you a lot of data sets out of the box. So I'm gonna make, we're gonna start writing code right here. We're gonna make some small changes, so get ready. Um, also, by the way, you know what's awesome? We visualized a data set in R with literally like one line of code. It was 10 characters within the code blocks to create a scatter plot of the cars data. That's, that's why R is so awesome. It's really designed to do this out of the box. It's just, it's made by analysts for analysts to do analytical work. So let's now do, uh, let's look at a slightly different data set called MT cars. It's a lot like cars, but with an M and a T before cars. So go ahead and, add, uh, and type MT, all lowercase, inside the parentheses before cars. Look at my screen if you need help. If you're not looking at my screen, look at it real fast just to see the difference. While you're doing that, here's a little inside information. MT stands for motor trends as this data set is from a 1974 Motor Trends magazine. I'm guessing this is pretty old. Uh, so if you click the green run command again, your plot will now become a lot of plots. There is so much data here, it's kind of hard to see what's going on. In fact, we need to change what we're looking at to get a better idea of what this is. Uh, and to do that, we're gonna have to line a lot more code, I'm sorry. We're gonna have to write a whole new line and edit a line we have. So there's so much going on here, right? It's pretty technical. So I ask that if you are worried, please look back on my screen to get the exact characters, punctuations and spaces you need. And once again, you're doing awesome if you're, you're caught up to here. And if you're not, I, I appreciate the effort. I think you guys are doing really, really good work here. I see messages coming in here. So Jenny, please hit me up if like I need to like stop and talk about anything. So here's the new lines. What I need you to do is create a new line between row 10 and 11. And you can just click the return uh, after the closing curly bracket on line 10. And so we'll just go above plot. Um, there you're gonna create what's called a brand new variable. And that's software speak for data and a, a data points as small as a single character or as big as a book or even more complex things like a predictive model. Uh, as long as the name of your variable is a letter without any spaces, you're gonna be good to go. So I named mine, my cars with a capital C. Um, and I, I recommend you do that to be easier to follow along doing the same thing. Uh, note the- And hey, Brett. Is, oh, yes? I'm gonna jump in real quick. In the chat, it sounds like for some reason, uh, the download is taking a lot longer than it should. So most okay. of ours hasn't loaded yet. So most people are just watching yours go and we're not able to follow along, just you okay. know. Well, let's back up cool. then. And we'll just back up here. 
Uh, let me know if, if you still haven't loaded yet, um, but I can go ahead and back up. I apologize, I didn't know it was gonna take so long. So, talk about me. We'll go right back here <laughs> <laughs> to uh, ideally everyone should be loaded by now. Um, jump in if you're like, I still haven't loaded, oh my gosh. And, and if not, um, once again, it I might think be just an older computer. We good? I think uh, still haven't loaded. I think the platform itself might be having problems loading because I'm on super high internet and mine isn't loaded all the way yet. The green bar is only like halfway through. So but if you want to just continue it once and it's like what is with these I like, know. 50 people taking it at one time. It's freaking so. out. <laughs> That's great. I'll, I'm gonna take a little bit of time here. I know I've kind of jammed this in, but um I take a little bit of time to talk about R. So R was invented in the late 1990s. Uh, as basically as a tool specifically designed by statisticians and analysts to really be very much data focused. And so what it does is it allows you to use a lot of uh, analytic models right out of the bat without having a lot of stuff. So, so when I showed like that plot, to do that in Python, I would have had to written a minimum of five or six additional lines, right, to get that up and running and good to go. So in R, I'm kind of just in there and I'm running with that data right away. I, I just want to talk over, I know we're going to go over two things today, one called random forest, which is a predictive model, and then another one called Holtz winter, which is a, uh, a, a time series model, which I'll talk about at the end. Um, but some other stuff that's really cool too um, is uh, stuff like linear regression. So that way, which is similar to, if we jump ahead uh, back to this uh, slide, kind of making this as I go now, this slide here, where we see the, the stopping distance versus the speed and that kind of progressing, you might have what's called a regression line that shows this path. So if we add new numbers on there, we could guesstimate, uh, you know, if I knew a speed, I could then use that regression line and say, well, if the speed is 25, I think the distance is going to be somewhere around 80, right? Because it's going to match up somewhere around there in that point, or maybe 25, it might match up to between 80 and 100. So that's a regression line and that does that a lot. Another thing are called um, clustering models. And this is a uh, really cool where you can basically have data sets of say um, where it doesn't have a perfect line, but maybe there's chunks. There's a big chunk might be in the top left or there might be a chunk in the bottom right. And then you can say, okay, well, here's a group in the, the top right uh, or here's a group in the middle. And it'll be able to say, okay, these are different groups and this is how you can group it together. And be able to set like here's the here these are cars that stop really fast, uh, even you know even at high speeds, and these are cars that even at low speeds take a long time to slow to slow down. So be able to do that. How are we doing in terms of uh, the uh, upload? I think the general consensus is it's uh, we've overloaded the system, and I think just go ahead with your presentation, and then people can follow along later with the recording if they want. But I I'm already learning a lot just watching your modifications on your screen. So I think it's great to keep going. I'm so sorry about that. I, I should have called them and said, we're about to la launch a bunch of projects. So, <laughs> all right. And needless to say afterwards, I will send you a recording and I'm gonna send you the files so you can kind of do a long, go along by yourself. So here we have my cars. Uh, basically what I wanna do is create a, uh, a variable. So we go back, uh, we wanna plot empty cars. Let me go back here again, see where, okay, so yeah. So we have all these plots and it's really a big mess, right? It's cool that R is able to plot all this stuff, but it's really hard to see what's going on. So what I'm gonna do is go ahead and create a variable. So uh, if, you, if, if anybody who's able to get ahead, the variable would go after that R, we could put it above plot. And basically the variable is, is really any type of data that we can kind of uh, group and remember. So it'd be like a character, like the letter A, it could be massive, it could be an entire book, or it could be a really complex thing like a predictive model. So as long as the name of your variable is a letter without any spaces, you're good to go. And I name mine my cars with, with a capital C, and that's called camel case, where you just, uh, nothing's capitalized except for like the second word when you jam two words together. And, and then you can add a space uh, and type the less than sign. So on my keyboard, that's the shifted version of the, um, comma key, and then uh, next is a dash, then you're gonna add a space. So that kind of like identifies where to put this, this variable. 
And then uh, we're gonna write our, our data, which is empty cars, and that's all lowercase. And this saves the empty cars data as our own variable. Now, when we call plot, we want to use our new variable instead of empty cars. Mine is the my cars, the capital C. So replace empty cars uh, with that if you're using the same name, uh, same name rules as I did in that little plot there. So I just wrote in my cars in the plot and whatever you, you call your variable. So if you run it again with the green arrow and the, the source uh, creating the same plot, you should be able to run it through. And, and if, if you didn't, if it kind of gives you errors, something maybe went wrong and it usually has to do with like spacing or capitalization. These are the most common errors. And if anybody is able to load up, I'm sure a few people got it. Um, uh, I'll give you a little bit longer in case you have any problems. So it's pretty straightforward. We write my cars, uh, the, the, the less than dash MT cars, all lowercase. And then in the plot, you put in my cars. So hopefully those that are still here, um, your code will run and be complete. But honestly, nothing will really change in that source window will stay the same. But you're going to change to see a, a change over in the environment window over on the right, and you'll see a new variable, uh, my cars listed. And if you are in here, if you have a chance to it, click on my cars in the environment window. And what's that going to do? It's going to open a file in the source window showing all the data in the variable. Here we see in the source window the empty cars data starting with date. Uh, on the data on the 1974 Mazda RX-4. It looks like we have uh, different miles per gallon for each car, and we have different cylinders, displacement, horsepower, one of them is real axle ratio, et cetera, and, but they all have abbreviated names, so it's really hard to tell what they are. Um, FYI, if, if you are following along, you might see on the bottom of my page or in yours, below the source window, a, a new little window there. After you start running scripts in a notebook, it actually runs the script in the console below your notebook code. So don't be alarmed by that. It's really just a record of what's been running. And it'll kind of show you when things upload and are, and are completed. So what we want to do now is create a machine learning model to predict something. For instance, we can use some variables about Mazda RX-4 to predict how many cylinders it has. So there's a lot of different analytics models but one of the easiest ones and the least error prone is called random forest. So I'm gonna run it now and then I'll tell you what it's doing afterwards. So we'll click back to our notebook, which has the very clever name of untitled one. It would be red and have a little star on it and if it isn't saved. And you can just click on that, the tab name to view it again. And then we'll go ahead and set up the random forest. So there's a couple of different ways we can approach random forest. But the easiest option is to use a pre-made package that is 100% focused on ran running random forest and has a very easy to remember name when working with random forest. If you haven't guessed it already, the package name is random forest. So just like thousands of packages you can use in R, you can, and all the ones that may be bogging down everyone's computer right now, um, it, it, you can go ahead and um, you, you can uh, install one right here. So the easiest way to me is to go to the tools in the navigation, and then you're gonna click install packages. And this is how you're gonna add more packages. So you're, then you're gonna see a little pop-up where you type random forest, and you're gonna type it all as, as one word and, and the little package text box. And as it types, it'll generally auto-suggest, and the, you're gonna select the one that's random forest, uh, this camel case. It's all one word in the F and, and forest, this camel case. You can see a few others. We're just going to select that first one and then click install. Uh, and if you've just been watching me, but you're able to, you can go back to your window and do this. Again, it's tools, install package, type in random forest, select the package and, and then check, click install. Maybe next time I'm just going to do it with one person at a time and just walk each one through it. So, the, so I'll just spend a couple days going through this. So uh, sorry about that one. Um, so once again, this is the last uh, thing that will load. Um, so I apologize uh, if, if this is dragging anybody down again. So this is going to take a few seconds. Um, but what it will do is first off, probably won't do anything at first. And then it'll write install package function in your console window. And then it will actually ins install and start. It's going to take a little bit of time. And it might take uh, maybe 
as many as 90 seconds. Once again, in, in that case, just go ahead and watch what I'm doing. And then anybody who's still able to let the load, let them kind of, well, they could follow along as well. And, and as I said, the good news is this is the last thing you'd have to load. So after this, if you if you mine it through here and in, in the, the uh, RStudio cloud is letting you through, we're in good, good shape. So after that is done in your uh, console, it's gonna show a whole bunch of red text. Um, that's good actually, I don't know why they do in red. Um, but you're, you're going to see something like installing binary package, random forest, a bunch of other random things. I don't quite know what all these things are. And then it's even going to tell you where it saved it, but it's on the RStudio cloud computer somewhere. So I don't know where that is. As long as it, this works, you're good to go. As long as it's say, you know, installing package done, you're, you're in good shape. Um, but uh, even though it's in your, uh, uh, your, um, your, your project, it's actually, you still need to use R in your notebook. And that's a little bit confusing, but don't worry, I'm here to help. So what we can do is, is just fix that. So we have to actually tell the uh, R uh, notebook that we want to use this library. Uh, so we create a new row 10 again, and above the my cars variable we created, and write the following in the new line, library, random forest, and library is all lowercase, and make sure there's no space, and then open parentheses, Okay, again, no spaces here, and then write the random force in camel case, and then close the parentheses, and that's how you're going to call the library. Uh, and once again, we've only written a couple lines here, so hopefully if, if you have are behind, you can, you'll probably be able to catch up right now, uh, because you really just need to have these three lines, or really you only need the first two lines. If you can do library random forest and my cars, empty cars, and you have random force loaded, you should be able to, to run through this. So library is a lot like a like plot. So it's called a function. And it, what it does is just pulls in a particular library that you put in the parentheses into the notebook. So if you if you were to run that code and get your error, it's probably because it got typed wrong or rain of forest wasn't actually installed. It happens a lot. Misspellings, the incorrect syntax, forgetting to load libraries. It's a pretty common issue. It's pretty normal. And once again, I think I mentioned very early on that uh, your analyst might be waiting for software to run. And that is uh, totally what's happening to a lot of people. So you are now understanding the pain of what is being analyst. That was actually my secret plot of this whole thing. It's for you to be like, my gosh, why does it take the analyst to do, do things so long? Well, it turns out we're always waiting for our software to load. It just takes all, all eternity sometimes for these things to load. So the next step is, is, uh, um, is sort of the magic. And this is going to be intense if you are coming along, because we're actually going to write our machine learning model right here. It's going to be a new line after row 13. And we're going to need to uh, call the random forest function, and it, it will uh, expect the following. So it's going to look for what, we're, what are the variables we're trying to predict. And in this case, we're going to try to predict cylinders, how many cylinders a car has. The next thing that it's going to add is all the variables that we're going to use for a prediction. Then there'll be a, a kind of a space and we'll put in our, a, a comma and we'll put in our data source, which is going to be my variable, my cars. And then last, there are a bunch of optional metrics and ways to make this really cool and smart. We're not going to do any of that today. I just want you guys to be able to learn how to build this model in just a few lines. So first, we're going to create a, a new variable name and a new line after our plot function. And this variable is going to have the name of our model. Once again, everything that I've done so far is right here if you have been able to catch up. Um, so the variable name is going to be the name of the model. The actual model is going to be living in this name. So I'm going to call mine my forest, which is one word and I'm camel casing it. It's a pretty common thing to do. I'm going to add a space. And then once again, I'm going to do this less than sign and a dash followed by another space. Now, instead of saying like, oh, I want plot or I want library, what I want is random forest. I actually want a function called random forest. So I'll write in random forest. Once again, it's camel case. So it has that capital F, but everything else is lowercase. Um, and then we're going to use open bracket. And within these brackets is where the model lives. This is, this is, the, the, uh, this is the, the magic, right? So the first thing we're going to tell the column is what we want to predict. And that's going to be the abbreviation for cylinder, which is CYL, all lowercase. And then we're going to add a space. And then you'll add that silly, it's called a tilde symbol. 
Um, you can generally, if you have a Mac or whatever, you can find it near the top left corner of your keyboard. Um, if you haven't used it before, congratulations, Here's, that's the tilde. Uh, the tilde, in this case, tells R the value on the left is what you want to predict. And then any values on the right are what you want to use to make the prediction. I'm going to use three, uh, of, three of the columns from our data, three var variables to predict the columns. So we're going to use displacement, gross push power, and weight to make our prediction. And FYI, I just randomly selected these. But in reality, selecting the right variables is one of the most critical parts of building an analytics model. In many ways, it's, it's more important to know the variables and understand them than it is to actually choose the model. Because you might pick a lot from a bunch of different models, but that how that data gets in there, what data you're choosing, that is, that is very, very crucial. And, and that's why it's so important, uh, going back to Jenny's presentation of like the analysts, um, they brought this person in, but they didn't really understand marketing data. So they were kind of probably putting in variables that were just like, that doesn't mean anything. Why would I care about that? It's just this. It's, it's knowing that what these mean and how they fit together is very important. So we're going to put DISP for displacement, then a space, and then a plus sign. So we're going to plus these together. So we're going to say this plus this plus this. So uh, and then after the plus sign, we'll do a space. Then we'll do HP for horsepower, another space, another plus sign, and space. I'm getting down to the exact syntax that is important. And then the last one is WT for weight. And after weight, make sure you put a comma. That tells uh, R that we are done with the, the identifying what are the variables, the column names that we're putting in there. So the, the comma after, and, and then you want to put a space after that comma. So then you're going to write data, all lowercase, equals, and then the name of your data variable. In this case, mine was called my cars uh, with a capital C. And then we're going to end it with a closing bracket. We are good to go. This is literally a machine learning model. This is like the craziest stuff that you you're hear about. You're like, this is machine learning. It's so powerful. It's like, this is this is this tiny thing is a, an actual very advanced machine learning model that, that got built and designed over many, many, many smart people. This is pretty cool. So you just built this predictive model using machine learning model. And if you first press run the script uh, using that green arrow and you get no errors on the lines, which would be like little red dots, um, you, you did it right. The funny thing is you might not have gotten any um, response. Um, I uh, get this like little um, warning. Um, uh, this just basically says that, hey, these aren't really the best variables to predict this. But we're not about quality, it's about doing. Um, this little warning still allows everything to run. It didn't actually give an error, so that's good to know. You might also see if you were running this yourself, it might have highlighted the plots again. If you click on that square of our console, it will, it will give you this here. So you have this predictive model. Are you feeling awesome? Or are you feeling a little bit confused? Like, I know the first time I did it, I was like, okay, is this it? This is, this is what we did? Okay, so there is a, one more step that I think I would like if you are able to follow along and you're still able to type, uh, and that's to validate a model. And in a real project, you would have what's called training data, and that's the data you give to the model and say, hey, learn from this. And then you hold some back data that doesn't see, and you call that test data. And then after you build the model, you run it against the test to see how well it predicts it. Uh, in this case, we're just going to test on the actual training model. Uh, no analyst would actually do that with real data, uh, but we could do it for this training. It, it's fine. Uh, so in order to validate that we just, uh, we just really need to want to call, it a, call our new model just to see how well it's doing off the bat. So that's the last line I would expect everyone to write today if you were able to keep up. So you would just add a new line under 14. Look at this. This is not very many lines. Uh, you just add, add a new line under 14 and type in your model's variable name. And for mine, it's uh, my force, just one word camel case. That's all you got to do. You just write the name. And then if you click the green arrow, you know, it, it, it may not be perfect, but here's what we got. And uh, my model is almost 94% accurate. And you can actually see the accuracy of the model in our training data with the percentage bar explained. It's the very last thing. 93.93% uh, should correctly predict 30 of the 32 cars. Now, you'll, you might note 
that the percentage does not exactly match if you pick 30 or 32 cars. I think it's like 94, 95%, right? Uh, this is actually due to the fact that Random Forest doesn't do a single prediction. It does a many, many predictions. So let me kind of explain what this is. Random Forest is based on a decision tree to make uh, its decisions, to, to decide. And if this was marketing data, you could use it to predict if a lead was likely to convert or what coupon should be emailed to a customer or how big of a coupon should be sent to a customer. And a decision tree would break down, break down a path to each option. It might look like this. So here's an example of uh, one uh, to make predictions on leads that convert and, and then breaking them out by a few different variables. So each split here is called a branch. And we see, I can see that it's able to make strong predictions right off the bat by breaking out leads by marketing source. Uh, and the colors of the boxes indicate how close it is to 100% conversions. So the white box would have almost 100% leads that convert and a black box would have almost 0% of leads converting. For instance, if a user came from Facebook in the first branch and then also had made a connection by a phone call shown in the branch after that, these calls from Facebook were 100% not a lead. Uh, and maybe in this fictitious case, maybe these were all existing customers and they were just calling their sales rep, but they're not actually new leads. Yet, if we go all the way back to the top and then look at Google ads on the left, you will actually see that 95% of those leads did convert. And this, that's why that box is white because it's very, very close to almost all of the converting and it's all, all the way to the left. But you know, as, as good as it is as those Facebook phone calls and the Google ads, there, there are weaknesses in this tree. The, the biggest one is the conversion rate of Facebook leads that came from the form of the website. And this is the box near the bottom left corner. And only two thirds of those leads became sales in this, this kind of made up uh, model. And the tree would then be long about one in every three of these forms coming from Facebook, not great. So we might be able to say, if we could look at these 12 leads that were in this model and, and maybe a different decision tree, uh, you know, the leads, as I said, they're the, the end little boxes at the end of the branch. So maybe we had a tree that broke out different ways. So maybe it broke out, broke out by weekly leads versus weekday leads. And then maybe by geography, we could actually get maybe a 95% accuracy for these 12 leads. But what if it now, now the Google ad, those, those uh, ones, the 20 in the Google ads now aren't as accurate. Well, that's where random force comes to the rescue. So instead of using one decision tree, random force was designed with the idea that there may be lots of combinations that can give you accurate finding on some data, but not all. So in random force, you're gonna create not a decision tree, you're gonna create lots and lots and lots of decision trees and kind of let majority rule. So if this tree said a specific lead would convert, but then all the other trees said it wouldn't, we would trust those other trees and say, you know, it's not a conversion, even though this one tree said it. So if we look back at our model, you can actually see uh, the number of trees is 500. This thing did 500 trees out of the box. Uh, I think that's pretty cool that it's doing all these different things. And I'm gonna dig a little bit deeper and kind of show you what's going on. Uh, for those of you that were able to keep up and, and, and uh, our studio cloud let you kind of type, I'm super uh, happy and th thankful and I'm glad you were able to do that. Uh, and if you weren't, I appreciate the effort. I appreciate everyone trying. I mean, uh, uh, you know what? Software is always going to give us a headache sometimes. I knew this is a little bit ambitious and maybe over ambitious. So I apologize for that. But I want to show you a little bit more code in the time we have left. Uh, but again, this code will all be in my uh, GitHub repo at the end of the presentation. You can download it and you can upload it in your R Studio Cloud uh, whenever it, it gets it's running for you. So. Uh, I would say, uh, suggest you might want to save it. Um, to do that, you just go to File and Save As, and you can save your notebook, uh, and that way it won't get lost. So let's look at some additional code that I, I created. So here I want to show how well the model predicted against our actual data. And what I uh, use is called the predict function. And what, what the model is doing is make a prediction uh, if it can only see displacement, gross horsepower, and weight, and then it guesses the number of cylinders for each car in our data set. It doesn't actually know the value of the cylinders, which is kind of cool. 
The column furthest to the left shows the actual cylinders in the data set. So there's like four cylinders, six cylinders, and eight cylinder vehicles. The top row shows what options the model might have predicted. And then all these values in the middle, it kind of shows what it, how it actually uh, shook out. And this is called a confusion matrix. And I'll, I'll walk you through this. But it really shows how out outcomes were predicted versus what they should actually be. For instance, it did a perfect job predicting all seven of the six cylinder cars, which is the, 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 the row that starts with the six. And, and all seven of them are six cylinders, according to our model. That's great. Did the same thing. There were 14 eight cylinder models, nailed them. All 14, it said, were eight cylinders. That's great. The weakness in the model is that two of the four cylinder cars were classified as five cylinder engines. Uh, I don't know if you guys know too much about cars. Five cylinder engines are very, very uncommon. There's not a lot out there. Uh, and there were literally no five cylinder cars in our data set. So it couldn't even have come up with that. There's, it would, should have been zero. So we all know that because there are no five cylinder cars in the data set, none of the outputs should have been five cylinders. And this goes back to the idea of domain knowledge and understanding the data set. So an analyst might come in and they could fix it a couple of different ways. One, they could just force it to say, only give me four, six, and eight. Don't, don't make up new cylinders like that. Or it could, you could tweak the model until it, it kind of like figures out that there's, no, that, that there's only four, six, and eight. And you can do that. That's where all those additional parameters are come into place. Um, so we played with a lot of fun data here that comes with the out of the box. But I did promise that I would go and show you how to use your own Google Analytics data. And there's uh, actually a way for R to talk to Google Analytics. And it's another library, and it has a really cool name. And the cool thing is, all you're going to need is access to a Google Analytics account, and your R Studio account, is assuming it worked, and that's all you would all you need. So, like the Rain of Force package, to get Google Analytics to work, you will need another package. And just like Rain of Force, the name of this package for Google Analytics has a very literal name called Google Analytics R. Um, and here's how easy it is, is to use. I would just I just installed Google Analytics R the same way I did with Rain of Force. I went to tools and then I installed the packages and I found the library we're searching for Google. Uh, and then it just kind of put in Google Analytics R. And it's that one, it's camel case, the A, and then that R are both capitalized. Now, one thing if you're doing this on your own or you want or, uh, in your, on your own time later is you're gonna, when you authenticate to connect to your Google Analytics account, you actually have to do that in the console window because our notebooks can't handle that functionality. So you would just go down that console and you would just write um, the code to authenticate, but it's relatively simple. You just call the library in your console, library Google Analytics R, and then you just say GA underscore auth, and then it will run you through the authentication. Like, you know, it looks something like this, do a pop-up. I would just say, yeah, connect to this account, and then I'd be good to go. And then I can jump back to my R Studio um, notebook and, and actually play with it there once I'm authenticated, as long as the authentication lasts usually a, about a day or so, and then you might have to re-authenticate the next day. Uh, but it's very simple to re-authenticate. So once I'm in there, I might actually pull the GA account list. And what that would do is something like this. Would, I could go look at that, make a variable for it, look at that, and it would have all my views listed out as a row. So I have my accounts for the uh, Google Analytics, or uh, Annabelle and Analytics and Insights. I have a couple different um, views there that I could uh, pick from. Those are all the same account, but those are different views. And then there's uh, some other ones, some portals and landing pages that we have. Maybe I'd use this to identify, hey, I have this view 1903455. This is our reporting view in Google Analytics. So I just put that ID in there. And that way, whenever I reference back to say, hey, I want Google Analytics, give me this specific idea from my account. If you tried this on number, you would get an error because you don't have access to it or you've hacked my email somehow. But uh, I'm assuming you haven't. So you would probably get an error. You would have to put your own number there. So, okay. So the next part is, is pretty long, but it's not super complex. And what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to actually go to Google Analytics and call the Google Analytics function and just look for, hey, I want this date range of 2018 through 2020. I want sessions and page views. I want uh, the dimensions of date and device category. So I'll have sessions, page view, date. And then, you know, is it like uh, uh, desktop? Is it mobile? Is it tablet? I also put an anti-sampling true 
just to try to avoid the sampling. If those familiar with Google Analytics loves to like sample your data, this is a way it like pulls it in small chunks and avoids that sampling. So after I pulled that and created this new variable called web data, it would look something like this. So we'd have the date and for, you know, September 1st, it would have, you know, all three would have desktop, mobile, and somewhere in there is a tablet, although there might not be any tablet for that particular day. So we had, you know, how many sessions and how many page views. And we could do some cool things with Google Analytics data. For instance, let's say you could, you could use this to predict the number of desktop sessions if you only knew mobile and tablet. Say somehow some of your data got corrupted, you could use that to figure out what, what, what the missing data should be, which is pretty cool. You could also use this to look for patterns in our sessions or pages, and I love to do that. And we would simplify that in something called a time series. And I know we're getting some complicated stuff here, um, but you'll be able to see this data at the end. And I added a few more libraries uh, that I, uh, to simplify the data here for myself. And I usually set, create those out. So we're getting a little bit complicated here. This is uh, what I'm gonna do is just gonna aggregate that data down just to day, day by data and day by day data to create it into a time series. So anyway, I'm gonna do a little bit of not magic here. This is not magic as we said, just, it's just math, it's just a program, we can all do it. And we're gonna transform that data into a time series. And basically means there's one point on each day. And that's what I wanna do. Each day has one point. So I just totaled up all those sessions or page views for a single day. And then I organize it in a couple different ways. I organize it either, is it by year, 365 days? Or is it by month, like approximately 30 days? Or is it by week, every seven days, there's a reset in the data where it kind of like has a pattern. And I just kind of looked at it. And I did find that the 365 yearly was a bit messy. The 30 and 70 day, seven day frequencies were interesting. And um, I'll look at some of the plots here. I actually plotted the 30 day time series. So you kind of get an idea. And what it does is you see these three plots. And we'll go ahead and dig into these. So the first plot is just our data, right? It's just what it looked like over time. It's kind of like, it looks like this. It's not, not very exciting. So the next one is the model of the estimate. And this does, it guesstimates what are the values. Not super interesting right now because we're estimating what we already see, but I'll we'll move back on this because it's kind of cool later. But the last thing I want to look at is called a, a decomposition. And this is awesome. And um, as it was again, it took one line to call this, but basically it takes our data uh, into three groups. So here we have, I believe these are sessions. So the top line is actually the, all the data, right? And that's exactly what we saw before. The bottom one called random is our noise, just what is unexpected kind of fluctuations in the data. The one above that is the seasonality. And that's where the 30 day comes into play. And here we can see basically uh, there's a, a kind of a drop maybe around the couple first days of the month. And then as the, the month ends, there's a big spike. And that pretty much happens every single month. It goes kind of down and then back up and down, back up and down, back up. It has a very seasonal pattern to it of a monthly pattern. But you know what, even that's not super interesting. What I really love about the decompositions is once it takes the random out and the seasonality out, what's left is the trends. Um, and that's really, really cool. And so here we can see kind of what just trends over time that are happening. One that I think is really cool is when we look at it is this little peak right here. This is from the data over instant conference last year. So you can see that it had a big bump in our sessions of, and then it kind of came down, but it never quite came down to what it was before, which I think is really interesting. And I think it speaks a lot to the value of the conference to us and why we ended up doing it again. But you can do this for all kinds of stuff. So let's say you had, um, you know, you want to identify, uh, you know, say something like, uh, did you do a Super Bowl commercial or did you go to an event or, you know, what's happening things that you did, maybe a new marketing campaign, what are the long, does it still have a long-term effect or is it something that popped up and then kind of died off? So that's really cool to see when you kind of pull out this, all this other data, you can just see those trends. Um, and you could use this more than just this data too. We could use it in price and sales. Um, we could use it all kinds of data that it's basically broke out in day by day. So as I said, this historical stuff is pretty cool, but let's go back to this previous plot and we're almost done here. So this is a model called the Holtz Winter, which is a forecast. And it uses information to collect on the seasonality trends and noise to estimate the number of uh, sessions going forward for the following day. 
and the black line is the original and the, uh, the red line is the prediction. If you can kind of see it, you can see the red line is a little bit off at first, but eventually it's pretty much right on. And what you can do is I can write a few more lines of code to basically create a prediction from this and forecast it six months into the future. And then it uses that to, to draw out the, the blue. So the blue line is the expected average of going forward of the amount of uh, say page views. And then the gray represents the upper and lower boundaries of our prediction. And you can see the boundaries get large and the further from you know, today, the bigger and bigger they get that because the more randomness there is of unknowing how far, you know, six months in the future. What I think is cool about this or really any other forecast library, there's one's called Arima or Forecast Profit, is you can estimate what's in the future and, and, and really see, you know, what's, what we you can use that in a couple different ways. So we could use it to, you know, in our marketing. And so we're going to update our marketing and we're going to see if we can beat that trend line. If we update our marketing, are we going to do better than expected? You know, you know what, we can also see what's the absolute max of our traffic. So maybe we need to know how much to invest in hosting. To say we need to change our hosting. This could be a really good way to say how much, you know, what is it, what is it kind of where we're going to think we're going to be to protect ourselves so our site doesn't load slow. So if, you know, 35 people tried to create accounts on, uh, you know, the RStudio cloud, it doesn't crash, right? Or, you know, we could do this our, our, on other type of data too, like sales revenue and being able to predict how much in sales we predict, so how much we're going to buy, how much product we're going to sell, uh, or even things like form submissions, really whatever you want. It's really, really cool. And as I said, it's not a lot of work. Uh, again, if you want to do this on your own time and when not a whole bunch of people are trying to do the same thing, you can go to my GitHub. It's just github.com slash brettstl. And if you just go to github.com slash brettstl, it'll list my different um, uh, groups and you'll find the data over sync 2020. It has two files in it. One is our, the one we did with the NT cars. And the second one is all this stuff I just did with the Google Analytics forecasting. So you kind of get an idea of how that works as well. So you can run it on your own computer. So you should be able to, to download those. As I said, you can just go to the github.com slash brettstl. Or if you want to go right there, it's just slash data over instinct 2020. So in a nutshell, that is like all of the code. I'm sorry that the software kind of acts crazy. It happens from the time to time. Um, I just want to say one more thing and before Jenny jumps in, which is, um, mm -hmm. you know, the algorithms are, are just tools. And then I like this quote, leaving society to algorithms will be like leaving healthcare to stethoscopes. The one takeaway is that the models are not what's impressive. It's us. It's, it's you using it and learning how to use it. And that's when it becomes awesome. So I appreciate your time and I'm sorry for technical issues. We did the best we could. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, Brett, that was awesome. Um, I know mine never loaded, but I learned a lot and really uh, enjoyed watching you walk through it and felt like I was able to still get some of the key outcomes. One question that, uh, so I've had a couple of questions be submitted. The first one is, how do you know what packages and data sets are available when you're using R? So you kept saying like, okay, just add these letters in front of cars. How do people know what's even available? Okay, so yeah, there's a couple of different things. One, the packages, the actual libraries, um, there's a, a site called CRAN, C-R-A-N. Um, you can do like CRAN R um, and or like CRAN R project. It will list all the packages. There's like over 10,000. So there's just so many packages. So everything that has ever been bottled is probably an R. It's super cool. Um, in terms of those data sets, um, if you actually do go to that, um, the console and you do uh, data, and then you just put open parentheses, close parentheses, and click that. It will create a list of all the different data that you oh. can do. have a list of say cars, MT cars, all the other ones that you can cool. have. Cool, very, very helpful. And I just had somebody privately message me and say, they're less afraid now to learn R. So <laughs> kudos, that was, that's pretty awesome. That's a great takeaway. Um, let's see, where can people go to learn more about the basics of R? So if they, if, if this interested them enough and they said, wow, I feel empowered, I want to keep going, where should they go? So that's a great question and it's a tough question. So I think like Code Academy and like uh, Data Camp are both really have a lot of stuff there, but what's going to happen and it happens with all of these like 
learning to code ones is it's going to be like, here's what a variable is. And it's going to take you an hour through that. And then it's going to be like, it doesn't jump you into actual machine learning until you probably spent yeah. like good six hours on it. So that's why I like yeah. to just jump in. And that's why I wanted to show like, you can do this cool stuff. If they're going to make it seem like it's hard, but you'll get to it eventually. Yeah. I actually used, that's awesome. to, used to do this through edX's um, Georgia Tech introduction to analytics modeling. But you know what they did? They said, hey, go build an analytics model in R. And that was it. I just had to figure it out on my own. I love it. Thrown right in the fire. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. One last question is what training resources would you recommend for someone in a marketing role that wants to become more analytics savvy? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, well, I would start with um, statistics. Um, and the basic statistics. So there's a course, another online course called uh, iHeart Statistics. It's, um, I forget who, I think it's another edX one. So it's through um, uh, statistics. Let me look it up. I believe it's from, it's, I believe it's on edX. And what it does is just walks you through some of the basic statistics model, like uh, regression, and uh, chi-squared. These are really basic and cool to learn stuff and they kind of learn it to you in Excel. Um, and, and it's so good to just learn those basics of like, here's stuff to be able to like, hey, if you have this input, here's how you can predict an out output. So I love starting there. I think that's really, really good. Oh, she found it right there. Awesome. I found it. I'm on top of it. Hey, Brett, thank you so much. Again, we're going to be sharing the recording of this. So if you weren't able to follow along, you'll be able to do it later. And I know Brett, We'll welcome any questions or comments you have, uh, be Lomire at anvilinsights.com. Otherwise, stay tuned because at 2 p.m., top of the hour, we have Maria Abrar. She is a data scientist at Trulio, and she has a really wonderful presentation that I know all of you are going to enjoy. We're going to continue on our trend of being really hands-on with our learning today. So stay tuned. We'll be back in four minutes. Thanks, everybody.